certified sports nutritionist. Yes, I work with athletes as well. Um, and Eric kind of said he's a product of Miami. I'm a product of Russia, of Moscow, and a little bit of San Francisco and Palm Beach, and now Miami for the past, I guess, eight, eight years. So I like Miami. Um, I went to Florida State University. I did my undergrad studies there in dietetics, and I got my master's there in nutrition science. I completed my internship there, and then uh, we, with my husband, moved down here. He's a physical therapist, <laughs> if anybody's therapy. Um, and I, I'm a dietitian. And I, for an everyday thing, I work with clients, um, and I also do personal training as well. So today, we're going to be talking about intermittent fasting. How many of you guys have heard of intermittent fasting? Yeah, it's a very popular term. It's super cool right now. Everybody's talking about it. So we're going to talk about what actually the research behind it. Um, this is how you feel maybe if you're starting intermittent fasting. He says, I would eat in an hour. That's like seven dog hours. I love dogs. I have a little dog. That's my life pretty much. Um, this is a quote from Dr. John Berardi. He has his own nutrition company. And he actually has done several experiments that he's documented about um, with intermittent fasting. But the quote is, eating is also a responsibility. When we cram our bodies full of fast, processed, low-quality food, we're not taking that respons responsibility very seriously. A day without food resets our perspective. We can remember not to take eating for granted. And I know somebody mentioned, like, you know, there are starving children. Your parents have, made, have told you that um, when you're growing up that you shouldn't waste food, you shouldn't play with food. It really, it really is something that we need to pay attention to. So that's also how you, maybe you might feel on a fasting day. <laughs> so there are several definitions of actually intermittent fasting. So the most popular one that you may have heard of is called 16-8. So this is where you're fasting for 16 hours and you're only eating in an eight-hour window. When you're fasting, that means you're not eating. You're not eating protein shakes. You're not doing amino acids. You're fasting. Yes. Well, we're going to get to that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's questionable. But yes, you can drink, for weight loss purposes, you can drink black coffee. Black, okay? But if you're talking about diseases, which we'll get to later, it just has to be water. Okay? So there's, there's different definitions of it. This is where... We're going to get into it. And um, for the purpose of my presentation, guys, we're going to do questions after just because I want to make sure I get through the presentation. I want to stay on track. So we'll do the questions after. Um, but this is the most popular one. And I remember when I first heard about it, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, it was a lady. She said, I don't eat until 11 o'clock. I was like, you're freaking crazy. Like, what is wrong with you? But then, of course, we do the research, and it's pretty amazing. Um, Lean Gains is also a popular website. Another terminology for this is called time-restricted feeding. So when you think fasting right away, people kind of begin to panic because it's like, oh, my God, I can't eat. I have to fast. Where's my food? Whereas time-restricted feeding focuses on feeding, but just in a limited manner. Um, eat, Stop, Eat is another book. Has anybody read that? No? Okay. Well, this is where you're doing a 24-hour fast one to two times per week. So five days out of the week, you can pretty much eat whatever you want. And then two, hour, two days out of the week, you're not eating, period. Okay? Uh, there's also the 5-2 diet, the longevity diet, and one three one method. And I actually began to experiment with my own inter inter intermittent fasting when I did the one three one method. It was Shalene Johnson. Do you guys remember like Turbo Fire, Turbo Kick? I've been following the women for, you know, a long time. And she came out with this method. I was like, all right, I'll try, you know, whatever. I'm open to, I'm open to trying anything. I, I use myself as a guinea pig. All right. So this is me in the morning. Um, no, <laughs> this is before I get dressed up for you guys. Um, so this is an experiment, guys, that was done um, with monkeys. So at the, between the ages of 7 and 14, these monkeys have a lifespan of about 27 years. So these monkeys are older. They're like senior citizens. Uh, between the ages of 7 and 14, this monkey started being restricted of calories by 30%. This monkey was able to eat whatever he wanted. They're almost the same age, 25 and 26. This monkey, he's aging really, really well. He has a nice coat. He has elastic skin. He has a smooth gait, which means he can walk upright. His posture is energetic, and he has an um, energetic demeanor. And his blood work is very healthy. Okay? This is the same monkey, but this monkey has been, been overfed for several, several years. All right? Uh, he's not aging as well. His posture has been affected by arthritis. His skin is wrinkled and it's falling out. His hair is falling out. 
Uh, Owen is frail and he moves slowly. His blood work shows unhealthy levels of glucose and triglycerides. I know this is seen in a monkey model, guys, but this is what happens when we continuously overeat, okay? And we begin to gain weight and our health begins to deteriorate. So this study did show that eating less calories was able to prolong life, so it increased longevity. Now, there was another study done where the, where the, um, the feeding was a little bit different, and that study did not show that there was any benefits to caloric restriction, but this study did. And, you know, doing all my research, guys, of course I want to give you the only the most positive benefits, and I want to tell you that intermittent fasting works, and it's great, and I will tell you that, but we have to understand also that it's not just like the cure-all. So I'm going to give you, you know, positive studies and also some things that are maybe not so positive. So these are some metabolism myths that I have heard that I was like deathly afraid of until I was like, all right, I can't do this anymore. So that we have to eat every two hours to speed up metabolism. Have you guys heard that one? Yeah. Okay. That if you skip breakfast, you're going to ruin your metabolism. That you need to hit your anabolic window within 30 minutes to one hour right after your workout with protein. All right. And the more food you eat, the faster metabolism you're going to have. All right, so when I first started doing CrossFit, and I was like all about the gains, I wanted to gain muscle, I was like, oh my God, I have to eat my food, and I became kind of like panicked about this, because I was like, oh my God, if I don't eat it, I'm not going to gain muscle, and this just kind of, you know, I wasn't like a real competitive athlete, you know, I did like Wadapalooza twice, but like I wasn't going to go and be a professional athlete, and these things are, you know, they're not really realistic, I believe, to follow on an everyday basis if you're not trying to be an athlete. Like, eating every two hours is completely unnecessary, okay? If you don't get your protein shake an hour before and you get it two hours before, you're still going to reap the benefits of it. It's not like the protein they eat is going to go away, all right? So if you're kind of, like, anal about your nutrition and you have all these rules to follow, it can kind of eventually get to your head, which it did to me. And I was like, I'm going to go back to what I know is right and what has worked for me in the past. So these are just some metabolism myths that, um, you know, you don't have to follow. Fasting has been referred to as the physician within. So um, do you guys have pets? Anybody have a pet, doggies or anything like that, right? So when they're sick, most pets will not eat, okay? So if they're not feeling good, they won't eat. If you have a sick child, most children don't want to eat. You have to, like, force feed your kids to eat soup or whatever when they're sick. So this is, you know, fasting is referred to the physician within. Um, And I grew up when I was in Russia in San Francisco. We grew up in a Russian Orthodox church, and... Um, we had to take communion. So by the time you turned five, you could not eat before communion. So I don't remember what time church was, maybe like 10 or 11. And I knew at that point, because I was already seven, that I could not eat before communion. So it already kind of like starts to develop like, okay, you can't just have food whenever you want. Obviously, it's for religious purposes. But this is also seen in Buddhism, um, in Greek religions, Christian religions. There's like the Daniel fast. There's, fasting has been mentioned in um, you know, many religious aspects. The month of the Ramadan, um, people are fasting from sunup to sundown. Okay, so it's not like something new. It's not like a brand new thing that we've never heard about. So I'm going to go over the benefits now, all the good stuff about intermittent fasting. Mind you guys, so I'm going to go over the benefits, but caloric restriction and weight loss does have some of these, does have some of these benefits as well. Okay, so uh, decreased triglycerides and LDL cholesterol. Decrease in blood pressure. Uh, markers of inflammation, so those are just uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha. Those are all markers of inflammation in our body. And the more inflammation we have in our body, that generally can lead to a higher incidence of disease. So we want to prevent that. We don't want to be inflamed. Oxidative stress, also markers of protein, lipid, DNA damage. Oxidative stress, we all go through it because we all work out. Um, even like endurance and marathon runners actually uh, endure more oxidative stress because they're constantly um, in a, almost like in a catabolic state if they're not fueling properly, okay? Um, and insulin imbalancing blood glucose levels. So these are all amazing. So these are all decreased markers, but those are all, that's all the good stuff. Increased markers, we have increased cellular turnover, increasing fat burning. Who doesn't want that, right? Uh, increasing growth hormone, yes, we can build more muscle. And there are certain um, times in the fast when you're fasting and that actually increase your metabolic rate. So this is like amazing. You're like, yes, of course. Why wouldn't I want to do this? I want all of this. Um, it can also help with regulating your hunger hormones. 
So PPY and ghrelin. So PPY reduces hunger, and ghrelin is like your hunger hormone. All right. So do you guys ever have differences in like fluctuation and when you're feeling hungry, like during the times of stress, certain times of the month, if you're traveling, if you're really busy, we tend to like not be as hungry. And then we finally relax. Our hormones are relaxed. Maybe our cortisol decreases, and we can finally eat. It's like I always hear, oh, I'm not hungry for breakfast and lunch, but when I get home, I'm starving. Yeah, because you've been stressed out all day. You're at work. And you get home, and just because you're home, you're finally relaxed. And your hunger, lo hunger levels and everything can finally return back to normal because you feel like a normal person. <laughs> Insulin levels are also very, very beneficial. Obviously, if we are pre-diabetic, just in general, we don't want to have high insulin levels, and we want to increase our insulin sensitivity. So type 2 diabetes develops when we become insulin resistant. So like we have insulin, but it's just not going into the cell. It's not going in because the sensitivity is not there. Type 1 diabetes is a little bit different. With type 1 diabetes, we actually don't produce insulin. Type 2 diabetes is something that commonly happens when um, you're overweight, stressed out, things like that happen. Or like, yeah, stress can also, actually, um, stress can also cause type 2 diabetes. And it can decrease markers of inflammation. So blood lipids, blood pressure. And we said when you're in a highly inflammatory state, this can lead greater to disease. Um, I, at one point, was overtraining in my life <laughs> for like a period of two years, <laughs> and I was stressed out as well. Um, but I just always remember, I kept telling my friends, I was like, God, I, guys, I always just feel inflamed. Like, I feel heavy. I feel like I'm retaining water. I was like, what is this? And I was really just over-crossfitting <laughs> because I love CrossFit so much. I just wanted to do it for like three hours a day and lift heavy weights every day. It's not realistic. You can't lift heavy every single day of your life and wad like an animal, all right? That's just maybe if you're 18. All right, I'm not 18, I'm in my 30s. So I just realized, oh, I can't do this every single day. I have to kind of take it easy. So if you're feeling like that, then also examine if you're maybe overtraining. Um, one of the biggest, biggest benefits that people do intermittent fasting is this guy right here. So cellular repair. This is also called autophagy. I'll have another slide on this. But autophagy removes waste material from the cells and it clears away damaged cells. So whether it's damaged cells that you have from working out, from stress, from whatever other factors, from smoking, from an unhealthy lifestyle, it can actually take these damaged cells and clear them away. That's the most amazing part. Uh, also fat loss, we kind of mentioned that. Fat loss increase in uh, human growth hormone, and that helps us to keep the muscle on our bodies and burn fat. And another big one is it helps to protect against cancer, Alzheimer's, and can extend lifespan. All right, so this, you know, I know we're all concerned about how we look, and I am too, obviously, a workout. But the bigger thing is, the bigger question is, and, you know, the things that you can consider is that we want to increase our longevity and feel good so we have energy and prevent diseases. All right, have you, you know, if you guys have family members with diseases that have gone through cancer, that have gone through Alzheimer's, I mean, if you have the ability, you obviously want to prevent those things as much as you possibly can. And if you have the tools and knowledge, then why wouldn't you? Okay, I know... Many people, maybe even some, I'm not going to say who, <laughs> but I'm like, I don't know why you're not taking care of your body. Like, you have the knowledge, you have the money. If you were to maybe lose 20 pounds, you can prevent heart attack from happening. You can prevent this from happening. But, you know, I can't, I can't force that into people's minds. But to me, I will say it doesn't make sense. If you're not taking care of your body, I feel like you're just, you're wasting it away, you know. It doesn't make sense to me. So this is the process of autophagy. So it has anti-aging effects that helps to destroy and reuse the damaged components within cells. And this is something, guys, that happens automatically when you're fasting. You don't have to think. You don't have to tell your cells or brain to do this. This happens already by itself. It takes the waste product inside, and it helps to create new building materials for regeneration. So think of also like MS um, and Alzheimer's, right? This is something that happens inside your brain. This can help to prevent it and actually help it can help to prevent the further degenerative factors from MS, okay? And you can think of this as like a housekeeper, and it removes misfolded or aggregated proteins. So again, any kind of damaged proteins that you have in your body for whatever reason, it can help remove them. Like, I feel like there's no, like, why wouldn't you do this? You know, it has so many benefits. Um, it has been recognized as a crucial uh, defense mechanism for malignancy and neurodegenerative diseases, and also... Again, preventing things like cancer, neurodegeneration, cardiomyopathy, diabetes, like the list goes on and on. So I think 
you know, after this talk, you guys are all going to go home and try it, I know. <laughs> so the other benefits, when we eat in a shorter window of time, if I say, okay, you only have eight hours to eat, you're probably going to end up eating less. So that's just kind of what happens naturally, okay? You also have a deeper awareness for foods and planning a meals. Because if you know, I can only eat from 11 a.m., let's say you're doing the 16 8 if you can only eat from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m., you know you're not going to be eating dinner at 10 p.m., so you have to be aware, what am I going to eat for dinner? What am I going to eat for lunch, right? You have to be a little bit more aware about this. I found with my personal experience, it also helps to decrease appetite. Okay, it's like the, so if you're one of those people that maybe behaviorally or like you're like a snacker and you can't stop, maybe it's from stress, it will help you with that. Um, the first two days, I will say, so with my own experience, the first two days, a little bit more like on the, I don't want to say rough, but they're uncomfortable, right? If you're not used to it, if you're used to eating a high, high carb diet all the time, you're snacking every two hours, it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but if you know that nothing really bad is going to happen, you can push through it. Just like work, I mean, your workouts here are uncomfortable, right? Who wants to do like 100 burpees? Like nobody wants to do that, right? It's uncomfortable, but you feel so good after you want to keep doing it. And it will uncover eating behaviors. So like the stress snacking or I don't know, what are, what are some like bad behaviors that you know aren't the most beneficial ones that you guys have? So you're like, yeah, I could probably change that. Yes. Uh, you can have, for weight loss, you can have black coffee. Black. So no creamer. If you put cream in it, you're, you're not fasting anymore. Okay. What's that? No, yeah, no, Gio, sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. That it's really up to you to be honest. Because some people fat some people work out fasted, and if you're not used to it, it would just take take time. So I mean if you want to do the full sixteen hours, then if your workout's at what, six AM? What time do you work out? Okay, seven AM, then you just count back to, I don't know what that would be, I'm not going to do the math right now, but whatever, 4 or 5 p.m., that would be your last meal, if you want to do that way. But I personally always work out, well, generally, like, if, I, if I'm fasting, and I, intermittent fasting, I'll fa intermittent fasting I'll be, maybe once a month or t for like a one-week period just for myself. I'm not doing it consistently right now. Uh, but I just, I drink black coffee and you just go. You don't think about it. And you might feel, again, you might feel some like the hunger but you're going to eat food. You can still eat the same amount of calories. It's just you just prolong it. You get used to it. You just got to, like, suck it up and do it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to do it. Yes. So this is something that you can do for, like, okay, so we were talking about managing a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can totally do it. I mean, you can do this as a lifestyle, or if you are, you know, want to lose weight and help your weight loss, you can do it for two weeks, you can do it for a month, or you can do it forever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Well, you drink coffee, and then you go, yeah. It's, it's really, guys, what you... And yeah, so for during the week, I get that. But if you want to do it, you will, period. Yeah. That's up to you. You can do it as a lifestyle forever if you want to, for sure. It's just if, you, if you're comfortable with it, it's something that you're able to do and you have no problem and it doesn't stress you out, you can do it forever. You can. You st yes, you still get benefits. If you guys do it five days on and you want to take the weekend off, you still get benefits. If, obviously, you're not eating like an animal on the weekends and drinking like you're in college. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering, so I really like the intermittent fasting, but it doesn't, like I said, I'm a teacher too, so it does not really work uh -huh. like, because I'm just so busy. But for the health aspect, is there a difference if you do like a – fast for one or two days as opposed to doing like a continual 16, 8, whatever? Yeah. Is there a difference in the health benefits? There, I, I haven't seen specific studies with like the 5-2. It is something that does have benefits. I just, I didn't find those studies myself for this presentation. Okay. But that's what the 5-2 diet is. And there's another guy that wrote a book on that too. And it is beneficial so that you eat 
you know, five days out of the week you eat a normal diet, and then two days you fast. So maybe you fast on a Monday and a Friday, and then the other days you eat normally. It, it will still have benefits, yeah. Um, yes. Yes, so while you're sleeping, <laughs> while you're sleeping, you're already automatically fasting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, your sleep counts as fasting. Yeah, you don't have to fast only while you're awake. So that's a good thing. If you're sleeping eight hours, you're already fasting for eight hours, and you just have to fast another four hours. Yeah. And so, you know, what's, what, you know, what's your name in the front? I know. I know. Okay, yeah, so long I know. So, yeah, so, you know, it's your teacher, and if it works for five days and for the other two days. But what I will find, guys, and from my own experience, if I'm fasting and I'm used to fasting, I want to continue that on the weekend. Because, like, I was doing fasting, and then I went to a trip to California, and I was like, okay, I'm going to eat breakfast. And I was like, oh, this, it did not digest well with me at all. So once you get used to it, you kind of want to continue doing it if you feel good on it. And it does take time, you guys, for it to, it does take time to get used to it. You know, if I'm, if I feel fine, like how I am and I just, you know, I'm cool and I don't want to do anything, I don't, I'm not going to do it. But I'm like, you know, I'll be honest with you. Once a month, I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to intermittent fast for one week because I know it'll take the extra two, three pounds off that I want to get off. Realistically, like that's how, I, that's how I use it now at this point. Yes. Oh, what, what's, what do you mean? What's the actual question? Yeah. I mean, what, I guess, what are your low, what are your, like, a 2, 3% body fat? You know, it's, you're still, I mean, you're still going to get benefits. If you're underweight and you do this and you're below a certain weight where you are actually malnourished, then no, I wouldn't recommend, you know, doing it. Yeah, you know, that, that's the one thing. So, like, I know there are people that do have hypoglycemia, and I think that's going to be to the individual, individual person. And I think with hypoglycemia, too, if you're going into intermittent fasting, you have to make sure you're not eating a super high-carb diet, like that you are eating fats and proteins so that you're not just plummeting. Because there are people that will just kind of like, you know, if they don't eat, their blood sugar is not very well regulated, and they will plummet. We don't want that to happen. So... Another way to get in it, guys, is you don't have to do full 16. Do 12 first. 12 is like a minimum that you guys, everybody should be doing, period. You should not be eating in a larger than 12-hour um, span throughout the day. Really, 12 is like your minimum, like always. That means if you go to bed at 10 p.m., well. Right, yeah, sorry. I was like, <laughs> do the math. Yeah, you have to. But so another thing you can do is work your way up to it. So let's say you, you're, you're used to eating a lot of time. So start with 10 hours, then go to 12, then go to 14, then go to 16, push it. You know, start to work. I, that's how I did it. I didn't just do right away 16 hours. Okay, let me just starve myself, you know, because that's kind of how your brain thinks if you're not used to doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to keep, keep going so we can get through. I'm going to show you guys some studies, and we can do a little more Q&A. So overweight adults with a moderate asthma ate 20% of their calories for alternate days. This is kind of what you guys were asking about the different days. So this is alternate day fasting. One day you eat, one day you eat only 20% of your calories. So they had an 8% decrease in weight, oxidative stress, inflammation, asthma-related symptoms, and quality of life improved. And this is just they're only eating 20% of what they usually eat. They're not even completely, completely fasting, Okay. Um, eight weeks of 16-8 intermittent fasting in resistance-trained athletes. So if you're an athlete, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose all my gains. It's not going to happen. All right? Uh, it actually did not alter muscle mass, and it also improved cardio, um, cardiovascular risk factors. Intermittent fasting, they say, also tends to in, uh, improve endurance. Okay? So that's another good thing. This is, is this the, okay, this is where it gets a little bit fuzzy. So, there were mice that they tested twice a week, and they fasted for 24 hours. The other days, they ate ad libitum. That means they ate whatever they wanted the other days. They were eating a um, standard uh, Western diet, 44% carbs, 40 fat, 16 protein. But because they were overeating the other days, they actually didn't see any of the benefits. 
Um, they did not improve mouse survival, or nor did it delay um, the prostate tumor growth. So they were looking at prostate cancer in mice. So this is kind of where it also begins to, like, you can't just, you know, if you're fasting one day, it doesn't mean go eat everything at the Cheesecake Factory and drink all the beers, okay? This is very interesting, guys. This is called the fasting mimicking diet. So this, you don't actually fast like with water and coffee. So this is developed by Dr. Walter Longo. He does a lot of, the, of this research at USC. And it's called a mimicking diet because it mimics what a fast is. So it's a, it's a plant-based food, dairy, gluten-free, and they give you like little packets of food. It's generally like liquid, okay? So you do this for five days. I think it costs around 300 bucks. You do it for five days, and then the rest of the days you have a healthy maintenance. So they did see the same benefits as if you were actually fasting because it increased the uptake of cells for uh, tissue rejuvenation. It suppressed autoimmunity and can stimulate demyelination. So this is going back to the brain. And it is in relapsing MS. They did a lot of animal studies with this, but they also did it in human studies. So this fasting mimicking diet. Now, one thing, you can't really recreate this because he's a scientist and he patented this, and I don't know exactly what's in it. You have to buy it from him. But if you want to do a fast, and, but you're not ready to go completely without food, then this is something you can do to still get the benefits. Yeah. Uh, kind of, but this is like heavily researched. This is by an actual PhD that this is his like life's work. The juicing. Right. Well, yeah, this, yeah, this is five days. Yeah, I mean, you probably could. I've never done one of those, to be honest with you. I have clients that have done those. But because this is like researched and it's actually been tested, I would be like, yeah, sure, why not? I'm, I'm most likely I'll try this at some point. This is where they did it with, um, they did three cycles of this, the fasting mimicking diet. So again, it, like the benefits are amazing. They decreased the biomarkers of aging, diabetes, CBD, cancer. They were decreasing the calories by 34 to 54%. Um, and it also decreased IGF-1. Is an increase in IGF-1 is related to um, degenerative diseases and cancer. So you want to regulate, you want to down-regulate the IGF-1. And then eating 15 hours plus has been associated with metabolic problems. That's why I say at least 12 hours. So just don't be eating, you know, um, from the time you wake up to the time you absolutely go to bed. But this is where snacking comes in, right? Like, oh, I had dinner, but I want a snack. So really, after dinner, guys, you should be going to bed and not eating after dinner. Um, with chemotherapy as well. So it's been said, and there's been also, you know, case studies about this too, but they discovered that not eating or fasting before chemotherapy, the patients felt better. So if you know anybody that's, you know, obviously, if you have somebody, you know, want to give us some information, make sure that person checks with their doctor as well. But the people that fasted before getting chemotherapy had a lot, they felt better, okay? And, um, and it protected the normal cells from damage, but it also made the cancer cells more susceptible to the treatment. So that's a double win. I mean, this is just water fasting. So when we're talking about the research and, like, the, the health benefits, like, when they say fasting, this is, like, the, yeah. I, I mean, it's still... Okay. The com yeah, I haven't seen a comparison, like, of, like, which is better, 5-2 or 16-8. I haven't, to be honest. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would, I would imagine, you know, kind of, like, logically thinking, I would, I would imagine that it, it would be. So this is one for reducing cancer risk. And, again, guys, this is very specific, but I'm going to give you the information. This is based off this research, researcher's website. So this is if you're already at risk. And this is not for healthy people, just like we're healthy, nothing's wrong with this. This is if you already have a risk for cancer and there's certain biomarkers you can test for. So 0.31 grams of body weight of protein. It's a lot lower than what us, you know, muscle heads like to eat. Plant-based diet, fish only one to two times a week. Um, healthy fast, six grams of vitamin C or ester C for six months. A supplementation with omega-3 and omega-6. Obviously, a low sugar, healthy weight, exercise, no alcohol. And they recommend doing the FMD, the fasting mimicking diet, for every one to three months or maybe even every month, depending on your risk. So maybe it's somebody that already has had cancer and they're afraid, you know, of the recurring, then this is something that you can implement. Okay. 
Um, and this is, so another researcher, Dr. Sachin Panda, goes into time-restricted eating. So time-restricted eating just, again, kind of like we were saying, intermittent fasting, but they use the uh, term time-restricted. So mice that ate 8 to 12 hours versus the mice that ate whatever they wanted were slimmer, healthier versus those who ate equal cows in a larger window of time. So this is just referring to just that shortened period of time. So when we eat is just as important as um, how much we eat. And this is because of our circadian cycle, right? So we are diurnal creatures, <laughs> humans. So we're most of the time, if we have a normal job, we're awake during the day and we sleep at night. This is how our body should operate. People that work night shift, their bodies never actually adjust to the night shift. Even though they say I'm adjusted, whatever, it's not actually natural for our body to um, be in that cycle. So like nurses, um, you know, firefighters. I have a friend that works, um, uh, like she does like organ donation for the hospitals and she's all over the place and her life's like, she's like, I just, I'm, I'm a mess right now. I can't get my, my life in order because I'm always, you know, you're always exhausted. So um, some more research to that. The mice that ate eight hours out of the day were 40% leaner. They showed no signs of inflammation, liver disease, and had healthy blood sugar. And the mice that nibbled throughout the day became obese, developed high cholesterol, um, high, blood, high blood sugar, fatty liver disease, and metabolic problems. Okay. So this is just a nice little diagram of um, when we should be eating. And our blood sugar control is actually better in the morning than it is at night. So in an ideal situation for intermittent fasting, you would actually start your meal, let's say at eight, and you would finish by six. Personally, when I, because I, my biggest, my busiest, busiest time is in the morning. Like I start work usually at six or 6.30. I don't eat in the morning because I have to be on the go with clients. I actually wait to eat till like 1 p.m. But in an ideal situation, um, you would start breakfast early and then you'd finish by 6 p.m. and then you'd go to sleep, okay? But there are certain things that happen while we're sleeping, you know, our liver, kidneys, they're, you know, sleeping obviously is very important. So this is just a nice little um, diagram of what happens when you're sleeping. Okay, almost done. So our take-home message. The take-home message, guys, is that intermittent fasting can be very, very beneficial. But caloric restriction is also very beneficial, right? So if you have an overweight person and they lose weight, the blood glucose is going to get better, the blood pressure is going to get better, those things will happen. The main thing with intermittent fasting is that it works on our body by, by different hormones. And the main thing is that autophagy, right? It's taking those damaged cells and recycling them and either getting rid of them or using that information to make new stem cells and to regenerate. It can obviously aid in fat loss and weight loss. It helps in promoting um, longevity, prevention of diseases, can increase endurance, and obviously will help you lose weight just because you're more aware of it. I mean, that was the biggest thing. I was having a lot of like GI issues as well. And it was something that I did to help that. But when you're going into it, make sure that you guys are also eating fats, protein, and vegetables, and not too, too many carbs. Because if you're used to eating candy, if you need that sugar thing every two hours, this is going to be tough for you in the beginning. All right? You have to kind of, I like to say, you know, slowly decrease your carbs. I don't know, maybe 100, 120, maybe even less right? Make sure you're eating healthy fats so that your blood sugar is already becoming stable. So you're not like super dependent on just the carbohydrate intake. I may not be um, appropriate for anybody, uh, for anyone, uh, because of caloric restriction. And especially if you have a history of eating disorder, or you, you can become obsessive about it. Like there's times where it does stress me out a little bit. And if I know I'm having an extra stressful week, I'm like, right, I'm just going to hold on for this. This is not the time to do it because I have to plan. I have to make sure I hate drinking black coffee. I love my coffee with almond creamer. I love my almond creamer. Like I just, because I already don't eat in the morning. I'm like, well, this is like something until I gave all my time to all my clients. So th that's the hardest thing for me is drinking my freaking coffee black. I'm like, <sighs> But I get nice quality coffee from Whole Foods. I get organic. I blend it myself. So it kind of makes it a little bit better. But that's, that's the, for me, that, that's the hardest thing. Um, so if you have any kind of history of eating disorders or of those obsessive thinking patterns, it kind of can make you a little bit nutty in the beginning. And if you feel like it's making you too nutty, too stressed out, then maybe you need to back down. Maybe just do like the 12 hours. Obviously, the adaptation period, 16 hours. Um, if anybody is doing the ketogenic diet, this helps get into ketosis. This is a, one of the fastest ways to get into ketosis. So 
you're eating a high fat diet, you eliminate carbs, and you do intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting with ketosis gets you ketosis a lot faster. You feel great on it, but I don't want to do it long term. <laughs> I've done it too. I felt amazing, but it wasn't something that I wanted to do for a year, you know, for like two, two weeks a month, great, and that's it. Um, and also, like if you have children in the house and they're like, oh, mommy, daddy, why aren't you ever eating? <laughs> You know, it might send them a wrong message, so just say, oh, well, I'm doing this thing. You can explain what you're doing. But if they're like, well, I don't want to, you know, because children can be finicky with eating anyway. So if they see you not eating breakfast or dinner, maybe you're only eating while they're at school, and they're like, what the heck, my parents aren't eating, but I don't want to eat either, right? So just take that in consideration if you have young, young people around you, or maybe explain to them what you're doing. I thought this was really funny. <laughs> so... We're going grocery shopping. I, you can kind of see it. So, I heard that you're going to the grocery store on an empty stomach. I also like to live dangerously. <laughs> That's not a good idea. You end up buying a bunch of crap. Um, here are some resources that you guys can um, look into. So the Eat, Stop, Eat, that's the 5-2. That's where you're eating and then you're not eating. I don't know. I, I've done like 22, 20-hour 20 fast before, but, you know, physically it's not more difficult, but mentally it's a little bit more difficult because you're like, okay, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to, you know. So you have to keep yourself busy. You feel great. You don't feel, by the time you do it, I wasn't ever starving, like, oh, my God, I need to eat right now. Uh, I, the longest I did was like 23. I don't know why. I should have just done the 24. But I, I felt completely fine. Like, I even did a light workout. You know, you don't, people expect that you're going to feel awful. You're going to be like ravenous, but you're really not. Um, lean gains, one three one method. Master Kidding Clock is, you can actually sign up to the, for this research and you can send them a picture of what you're eating and they collect research based on you guys. Um, Found My Fitness is a doctor, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, that discusses this. She has interviews with um, some of the, the professors that I, made, that I mentioned. And Precision Nutrition, that guy did an experiment on himself so you can read all about it. So he did, like, he did alternate day fasting, he did 16-8, and he kind of gives you a big... A PDF download for free that you can read based on his experiences and what he liked and what he didn't like. All right, guys. So that is my email. I did not bring my business cards, of course, um, but you can <laughs> you can email me. It's Lisa Scott Nutrition at gmail.com. I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook, a little bit of Twitter, not really as much Twitter, but I'm at Lisa Fit, and that's my website also, LisaFit.com. So if you have any questions, I'm here. I'm taking.